You're listening to the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Podcast, a podcast about Lynchburg sports. All righty, howdy, folks. Welcome into the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Podcast, a podcast about Lynchburg sports. Sorry to repeat the title right after the intro said it, but it's catchy and I like the title of this show. My name is Tim Laduca. I'm the director of athletic communications. We have a pilot episode out. You can find that on Spotify or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. It gives you the landscape of the podcast a little bit. Talk to Evan Gates. It was kind of just a sample show. But this is truly episode number one. Uh, the the way that we're going to be rolling these out every other week about is just talking to a student athlete and a coach, for the most part, from Lynchburg, talking about some theme in college athletics. But this one hits a little bit closer to home as today's episode is focused on why Lynchburg. So in this episode, you're going to hear... Emily Brubaker, a senior on the women's golf team, and head coach Travis Beasley of the reigning national champions, the baseball team here at Lynchburg, talk about their story, how they came to Lynchburg, and why they chose Lynchburg, and why they chose to stay here and have been so successful here on Lakeside Drive. So we're going to hear Emily Brubaker's interview first, then head coach Travis Beasley, We didn't get too much into their background, so I'll just give them their resumes. I'll give you their resumes here. Emily's is obviously very extensive as she came in in the second year of the Lynchburg women's golf team being on campus, and she's been a first-team All-ODAC player each season. She's an All-American scholar. She was the Farm Bureau Insurance Scholar Athlete of the Year in 2022, and that was also her sophomore year when she was the tournament medalist. That means she won the ODAC championship. Uh, She was also all region. She was the player of the year in the ODAC. She got an at-large bid into the NCAA tournament. And last year, of course, very successful as well. As we mentioned, first team all ODAC every season, first team all region, first team all state. And she's the program leader in scoring average at this point, around 76 every time she rolls it out there on the links. Um, only in her junior year, she's won nine tournaments, including that ODAC championship in 2022. She comes to us from Raleigh, North Carolina, Cardinal Gibbons. She's a marketing major. The second interview you will hear is with Travis Beasley. Beasley, he's got a little interesting story here as he's in his first season as the head coach of the Lynchburg baseball team took over in August, 2023. But six, for the six years prior to that, he was the associate head coach working with uh, then head coach Lucas Jones, who's now taken his role. They've kind of swapped roles. Lucas Jones is now the associate head coach. Travis Beasley's taken over as the head coach. The two have been working together for many years. You're here, you're here uh, Lucas, or excuse me, Travis, talk about that, you know, how close their, their relationship is together. But... Travis Beasley, he's an ODAC guy. He graduated from Randolph-Macon in 2006. He was an All-American. He was the pitcher of the year in the ODAC. Uh, And he went on to have a professional baseball career playing in the Boston Red Sox system for many years. Uh, And he he moved around a little bit. He coached at VMI before coming to Lynchburg. He's got a lot of players that have been drafted. He has some VMI products that are playing Major League Baseball now. Of course, Grayson Thurman who was an All-American now two years ago for Lynchburg, had 107 strikeouts in 2022, uh, and he's now in the Blue Jays system. Uh, Really lucky to have Travis Beasley on staff, and you're also going to hear him talking to me coming up after Emily's interview. So without further ado, enjoy the first episode of the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Podcast, a podcast about Lynchburg sports. All right, as we said, we're here with Emily Brubaker. Hello. Not to give you any pressure, you're a golfer, so you already perform well under pressure. This is the first interview we're doing on the Lynchburg Hornet Sports Podcast. Okay. So we'll just see... We'll just see, see how things go. We were talking before we started recording that people only want to listen to podcasts with famous people. In a way, just on this campus maybe, do you feel kind of like a famous person? 
kind of. There's a lot of people here that know me that I don't necessarily know who they are. And then a lot of professors, whenever I'll pass them, they'll always say like, hey, I saw you on a scoreboard or you did so well in a tournament. And I'm always like, thank you. But in my head, I'm like, I, I haven't had you and I don't really know who you are. So, so it's, it's it's a weird feeling, but in a way, yes. It's a weird feeling, but just, is it enjoyable? Are you happy it's, to be It's nice. Zone? It's kind of nice to be like recognized by people that I don't necessarily know because then it kind of shows me that I am doing well at it and it's not just something that I realized, it's something that other people realize as well. Okay, so there's a lot of different accolades we could go through. Individual medalists, ODAC champion in 2022, I'll start there. That was almost two years ago now. Is that a feeling you're chasing? Where where does that you know championship land in your memory and how do you rank it throughout your time here at Lynchburg so far? Um, my sophomore year was is the best that I've had so far and it's a memory that I always whenever I'm playing I'm always like I kind of want to get back to there because it it was great I essentially had the year of my life I made it all the way to nationals and that was such a fun experience and of course I want to do that again every year um I think that year ranks pretty high when I think of my time back here whenever anyone else that I know like my parents or friends and stuff they're always like what year like what was your favorite part and it's always back to just that sophomore year capping it out with ODAX and then nationals because it was a great experience and it was something that not many people can say that they've had so I feel really honored and blessed to be able to say that I do have that experience yeah and and we're just so lucky to have you doing it wearing a Lynchburg patch on your on your polo while you're playing on your hat on your golf bag let's just ask that question why did you decide to come play golf here at Lynchburg um So I realized that Lynchburg was a lot like my high school and it was the classes were small and all the professors knew you. And and I knew that I liked that like before I even started looking at schools. I knew that with how much time that golf takes and how much you miss that it's so important to have a good relationship with your professors. Because when I'm always gone, if I need an extension on something, they're more they're more likely to give it to me because they know that I will get it done. I just I have not had time at all. So that was a big factor when I was coming here. And then something my mom said was make sure that you go to a school that you like regardless of whether, uh, like uh, regardless of the weather conditions or whether you're playing or not, or if for some reason you have to stop due to injury. So when I first came here, it was sunny and it was in April and it was beautiful and I absolutely loved it. And then I came, um, I saw more photos of it and was up here again when it was uh, wet it was very wet and I still liked it it was it was still a beautiful campus and I loved being able to see all the mountains and then I knew that with the small classes it would be such a luxury to have when I'm always gone and I I love I just loved the feel of it it was just under three hours away from my house so I knew that if I needed to come home for any reason that I could but it was still far enough to be like I don't have the urge to really need to leave or anything so overall I just kind of came on campus and was like I think this would be a really good fit for me and then when I toured schools after I never really had that same feeling so looking back I was like I think Lynchburg is the spot for me so a player of your prestige you know you come here and you're instantly one of the best players in the conference did you have any reservations being that when you were recruited the team was in its first year and then by the time you get here, it's only year two. How did you weigh that in your decision making? It honestly, I think it honestly helped because I knew that when I came here, I wanted to play. Like I wanted to play right off the bat. I didn't want to be one of the ones that might not be playing until their junior or senior year when all the upper class people have already left. So I, I think that really helped because I knew that since it is a new program, I would be the ones that I would, my name would be going in the record books. And that later on people would be chasing after the records that I had already done instead of vice versa. So I I think it helped a lot because it was nice because it was a clean slate. So they had already done, by the time I came here, they were only a year in, like you said. So there were a lot of records that were already put in there. But knowing that it was something fresh and something new and that if I came here and did well, it would help them get on the book, like the school to be more recognized was something that I was kind of looking forward to and that I really enjoyed the idea of. Yeah, well, you said you wanted to get your name in the record book, and it's not just because there's only one year already, you know. Yeah. 
you've put your name in there in a lot of ways. Uh, nine individual tournament championships. I thought it was ten at one point. I gave I know. you credit for the Bridgewater one last did. year. But uh, I think your name's going to stay in there at the top for a very long time, and that's just a you know, credit to your skill. And just why don't you tell me a little bit about what goes into your training and how Lynchburg, maybe Coach Viverka, Coach Kopanek, Coach Smith when he was here, my friend, shout out to you, Alan. Uh, how have they contributed to your success? Um, Coach V has been great. He's always been supportive and whenever – he had he had that opinion and that view of maybe he saw a way to play a hole in a different way than I would. So it was nice um, before Coach Kopanak was here. It was nice to talk with him because he would be like, well, you could do it this way. And then I would see it a different way. And then we would like kind of talk as to like which would be the best outcome and like which I'd be more comfortable with. Um, I didn't spend a ton of time with Coach Allen in tournament-wise because he was mostly with the boys, but whenever he did come with the girls, he was always that sunny, positive person. Mm -hmm. You would see him jumping up and down on the near the greens if you hit it on. So that was great to have that no matter how bad you did, he would just still be there smiling, which helped everyone else smile as well. And then Coach Erin has been great. She and I have – I've spent the most time with her because we have very similar, like – we have very similar ways that we think. And so if there's a spot on the course where I'm like, this might go well and this might not go well, this could potentially go very badly. She's just always the person that's like, well, at the end of the day, it's your it's your call. So if you feel comfortable with it, then go with it. And so it's nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of, but also will be the person to be like, if you trust yourself, then go with it. Because a lot of coaches and people will be like, if you're a little iffy about it, you might just want to play the safe route to just call it a day. But she's the one that will be like, if you are comfortable with it and it is riskier, but you think you can do it, then just go ahead and do it. Because if you feel confident in it, then that's all you really need. And then you have the privilege of playing at Boonesboro. It's a beautiful course. And golf is a little bit of a different sport in that you are off campus playing, but mm-hmm. you're playing at a really nice facility. Tell me about Boonesboro and how training has been affected, you know, getting to play such a nice course every day. It's gorgeous out there. It sucks in August and September with all the gnats. <laughs> That's terrible. But other than that, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's nice because with how hilly it is and how much – there's very few spots that are flat – there's always at least some uphill or some side hill. So it's nice knowing that every tournament and course we go to, for the most part, they are easier than what Boonesboro is. So it's nice having that really hard course as our practice one to get us used to what we see um, at other tournaments as well. And then the iron range that they have there, it's that it helps you a lot because although it is right next to the road, it kind of puts the pressure on you to not screw up because you could hit a car. <laughs> And it just, overall, it's gorgeous to go out there. While it is a bit of a drive, it's something that, like, when you're leaving classes, it gets you off campus. So it kind of gets your mind somewhere else where if you had a stressful day, you're knowing, I'm leaving for a bit. I'm going to this gorgeous golf course where all of us are normally out there and we're always hanging and we're laughing. So it's always nice that when we leave, we know that not only are we going to a beautiful place to have a practice, we're also going there to have like fun with our friends and see people who like see our teammates that we might not see like during the regular day. Tell me a little bit about making friends here at Lynchburg and then your teammates. Did you know anyone before you came to Lynchburg? I did not. So how did the golf team help you kind of get comfortable, have your own you know, place to meet people, and then have you met people outside of the golf team? I, yeah, I've met a lot of friends through classes and stuff, and, I mean, everyone here plays a sport, so, well, (laughs) most everyone, and so anyone you talk to, if they play a sport, you always have some kind of connection, we'll be like, yeah, we have this training that we had to get to, and then you can talk about that, and so that's been great, and then with golf, I didn't know anyone coming in, but my freshman year, there were four girls, and Coach V put it where we were all together rooming. So I live with the other Emily and she's been great. We've lived together every single year. She's my best friend. And, but it was weird freshman year because freshman year was COVID and we weren't allowed to leave and everyone was stuck inside our dorms. So it was kind of harder to reach out and make friends. But 
the core of my friends have all come from the golf team mm-hmm. and and I love that because I'm I'm with them a lot and they're all super fun and a great personality to have and then as COVID stuff calmed down I was able to reach out more and talk to other people and spend time with other people and that's how I found a lot of my roommates so every year I've had a different a different group of roommates besides Emily and so that's kind of great the people that I've lived with in the past I still talk to on a regular basis and they might live with other people and I live with other people but we still are constantly talking so it's it was a lot easier to make friends than I originally anticipated well that's good a um, couple more questions here if you were to go back and recruit yourself like pretend that you're hosting Emily Brubaker for a recruit visit you already knew you know just by googling it and and we're very we advertise it a lot small class sizes <laughs> mm-hmm. homey feel what would you tell yourself about Lynchburg to get you to come here? What have you found out in these last couple of years that's really made a difference? You can't pass on this one. I think this is a really <laughs> good question. Um, <laughs> I don't. Coach V did a he did a he did a really good job of recruiting. Uh. Because the, the biggest things for me was honestly the academic side. And because I knew that wherever I went, I wanted, I wanted it to be academics first. And that's what I'm so glad I, I have here. Um... Come on, I know when you graduate, you're going to miss something about this place. And it's not just going to be classes. Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to miss a lot. But like... Everywhere you go, they say that you're always going to make friends and stuff. And so when I leave, that's going to be the biggest part. But going, like, on a recruiting-wise, it's hard for – it would be hard for me to say, like, to myself, like, you will make a lot of friends Mm -hmm. because I feel like that's what everyone says. Uh And so it's hard to kind of, like, name that one thing that would have – he could have said differently or otherwise that would have still brought me here. If he had – could he have looked into the future? Does that work? You, Yes. Yes. If I had known that I was going to do how, as well as I'm doing now, that would have been a, that would have been a given. <laughs> well, I mean, when you look at our athletic <laughs> programs across the board, that, They're that, good. that really, you know, we're good. Yeah. When you stack up, you know, even as a, a newer player, you're one of the best players in the conference. And across the board, we have that, so... Just Lynchburg advertising its ac- uh, academic success, which was important to you, but hammering home a little bit more, letting people know how much success our teams have. We always have teams in the tournament, always yeah. are competing for a conference. I, I honestly, I think the athletics department would have is another good seller because they've they've done so well, and so many teams have made so many records here. So it's nice knowing that kind of wherever you go, people will be like, "Oh yeah, that." that school has this sport that's done this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear that much. So, yeah, I think there you go, the academics department. (laughs) Okay. Well, there you have it. Um, Looking here for a couple follow-up questions. You know, I wanted to keep this one a little bit more serious. I have a little bit more fun on the Lynchburg Reels. Have you seen Lynchburg Reels? I have seen them. What do you think about Lynchburg Reels? I like them. They're funny. Do you have any notes for me? I liked the one where you asked Miles to rank random things. Okay. That, that one was my favorite. we got to come up with a couple more creative like, little segments. Did you catch the Lindsay hair thing where her three favorite animals I morphed into one using AI? I have not seen that one yet. All right, check oh, that that's, out. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You morphed them into one? I, I just typed into AI, combination of a hummingbird, koala, and dolphin. Oh, that sounds scary. It, was, eh, it, it really just resembled pretty much just a hummingbird. <laughs> With a little bit of hair, but in, like, the shape of a dolphin. Oh, okay. That's not bad. I'll, I'll have to watch that one. Yeah. Okay. Well. Oh. Think about bringing back the Wheel of Hornets. Were you a fan of the Wheel of Hornets? Yes. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Okay. When you just spin it, and yeah. then that was who it was. Yeah. Because yeah. we post, we just post way too much Emily Brubaker on the Instagram. <laughs> it seems like every other picture is Emily Brubaker, so we had to find a way to get someone else onto the feed. <laughs> Yeah, when you did the all-scoring leaders, my mom was waiting for the yeah. golf to come out. She goes, it's got to be you, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I would think so. Yeah. She was very excited for that. Yeah. I mean, how lucky is that you're leading the team, the program, in scoring? But then Eddie as well, 
he's also an active player who's, who's I know. Leaving. It's cool having both players that are still currently here. And he still has another year, so he'll probably do a lot more. Yeah, and then even Andy is second. So, mm-hmm. I mean, just the golf program overall is in a really, really good spot. Excited to see what new heights they can reach. You know, I guess the next goal besides Odax would be bring the whole team to the national tournament. So we'll see if y'all can accomplish that. In the meantime, Emily, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Thanks. Go Hornets. Go Hornets. (laughs) This was stressful. I wasn't ready for that question. Which one? All right, you just heard from Emily Brubaker from the Lynchburg women's golf team, and now we're with the head coach of the Lynchburg baseball team, the defending national champions. Really just kind of surreal to say. I uh, really haven't talked to you in an official capacity since winning the national championship, but uh, Coach Beasley, tell me a little bit about what the last you know few months have been without baseball after winning it all in Iowa. Well, Tim, first, for ha- thanks for having us on. Of course. Um, yeah, it's been pretty crazy, obviously. Uh, unbelievably fun. Um, you know, we won it, won the national championship on a Thursday in Iowa, flew back that Friday. I think we had to leave the hotel at like 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. back in Lynchburg that night. Um, I think that's really when it started to kick in because when you're in Iowa, you're just with your players and your families, friends. Um, so you're kind of isolated from – the reality of what you've done and how many people are kind of connected to it. Uh, And then when we got back to Lynchburg, you know, we had a police escort into town, fire trucks, people waiting on campus. So I think that's when it kind of first hit home of maybe what we have accomplished. Uh, And then certainly, uh, you know, the summer running into so many people with their stories, following us, watching the games, other coaches, parents, uh, whoever you might have. Um, And then, and then of course this fall, um, all the recognition we got, you know, the city of Lynchburg, uh, Liberty football had us over for a game, um, you know, the hall of fame dinner recognition for our team as well as, uh, as an alum as well. Um, so just really cool. Uh, again, a lot of parts of it and moments were surreal. Uh, you know, I know when, like that first practice this fall, we're out there. Um, and, and partly because coach Jones wasn't with us this fall. Um, and, and I'm sure a lot of people know that story, but, um, but just being out there and your first practice and you're like, does it really feel like we're national champs? I don't know. Did we really do it? Just kind of feels very normal, like right back to where we were, you know, a year previous. So, um, unbelievably fun. And I, I think more than anything, I'm excited for like 10 years down the road when we get all these guys back together, uh, for whatever event, whatever it might be. And just to hear all those stories again and, and compare how the stories have changed mm-hmm. over a 10 year period. But, uh, just incredibly thankful that I was part of it. Well, the story kind of goes listening to the way Lucas talked about it is when you two first got together here at Lynchburg, which was about seven years ago, you guys talked to each other and said, we're going to win a national championship. Uh, he did. Okay. <laughs> Truthfully. Uh, yeah, that was part of the plan. So uh, Lucas and I played against each other in college. Uh, our first coaching jobs together essentially were – uh, at Randolph-Macon, which was my alma mater. Uh, my family lives not very far from Randolph-Macon. So when I was uh, still playing with the Red Sox in the off seasons, I'd come home, work out, and help coach uh, the Yellow Jackets. And the the second year of my uh, professional career, uh, Lucas got hired as the full-time assistant at Randolph-Macon. So there was like three off seasons where we were the two assistants. Uh, and Ray, Coach Hedrick at Randolph-Macon was – I was lucky he let me essentially just coach, even though he knew I was leaving for spring training every year. So Lucas and I shared a itty-bitty little office in the football annex right by the weight room. We talked baseball every day, um, and that's really where we became really close friends. Uh, and even – so that would have been like 2007, I think, um, to till about 2010. And even all the way back then, we, we talked about, hey, when we get a chance, you know, if you're a head coach, I'll come be your assistant. If I'm head coach, will you come be my assistant? So we had talked about that even all the way back to then. Fast forward, I'm the pitching coach at VMI when he was hired as the head coach at WNL. We're living in the small town, Lexington, Virginia, hanging out with his family. So when he was hired, or, or even before he was hired, when he was in talks of becoming the next head coach at Lynchburg, his alma mater, he was like, hey, if I go, would, would you come with? And, and for me, it was 
it was probably more than anything, uh, you know, about a change, just getting to a different city, and then uh, an opportunity to coach with one of my best friends, someone uh, that I could help him do something as alma mater. But I know, you know, in multiple conversations he had, he talked about, you know, a big reason for him making the move would be, I think I can win a national championship there. I think we can win a national championship there. So I believed him. I think we were both on the same page. Uh, I think probably initially he maybe had a little bit more belief than maybe I did. Um, but as it was an incredible six years. I know we worked incredibly hard to kind of get to the program where we were at least in that conversation, you know, even all the way back to 2001 when we made first regional in, in a long time. Um, but, man, it was a lot of fun. So dive into a little bit why your time here. Why did you? What did Lynchburg do to set you up for the success? You know the campus community as a whole, uh, the other players, the other people on staff. Why was Lynchburg the destination to win a national championship? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think for me, you know, at least personally. So when I made the move here, I think I would have been like thirty three, thirty four, something like that. I'd been coaching at that point. Uh, full-time for seven years, but had been really coaching in some capacity for about 10 or 11 years. And what I kind of figured out, and, and I was fortunate, I coached, you know, alongside some really, really good head coaches, some really talented assistant coaches um, at Randolph-Macon and, and Virginia Military Institute. And I think at, at my point in my career, um, when Lucas asked me to join him, and I think he was in a similar place, it was uh, more about who I was around rather than necessarily like where. And by the where, I don't mean necessarily the school, more the level. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't all about D1, D2, or whatever it might be. It was like, hey, where are good people? Where am I going to be happy? Where am I going to like to go to work? Um, and certainly Lucas was a big catalyst for that, being the head coach and the guy that was hiring me. But it didn't take me long to figure out once I got to Lynchburg that that was um, the separator for this athletic to program. Uh, it was uh, the people, the personnel, um, from athletic director Waters to Kelly Gunter in the office, all these incredibly talented head coaches, um, some really cool, energetic, enthusiastic assistants that just had a passion, um, not only for coaching, but a passion uh, for the University of Lynchburg. Um, and they had also been incredibly successful. I mean, women's soccer won a national title in 2014. I think lacrosse national runner up in 15, men's soccer runner up in 2010, I believe. So there, and I remember when we, those first couple years, um, or really up till prior to last year, when we would do visits and walk families around campus, we would stop in Turner Gym, you know, and show them the women's soccer national championship trophy, the men's lacrosse national runner up trophy, men's soccer national runner up trophy, and, and just helped explain like there's a blueprint here. You know, this place attracts high caliber student athletes, not only just the athletes, but good students. Um, and there is a blueprint here to have success on a national level. And not every uh, not every school in America can say that. Not every school can can honestly look their coaches in the eye and say, hey, you have a chance to win a national title. We knew baseball had a long ways to go, of course, but there's no reason if soccer's and the lacrosse and I think basketball at the time was just coming off uh, men's and women's winning ODAC championships. Mm -hmm. Um, field hockey, Coach Enza Steel with whatever that record is, number <laughs> at this point. Um, so there was a there was 100% a blueprint here. We just kind of had to almost catch up with everybody else. Um, but what stood out more than anything were, were just the people. And a big part of the people, of course, is the student athletes. Not to get too much into the recruiting, but what are some of the big things that you tell your kids on the front end, this is why – you want to come to Lynchburg. What is attracting them to this school? Yeah, I think it, you know, so the school, I think it's a cool environment because it attracts all types of different students. You know, there's a, there's a path here um, for students that are incredibly uh, talented, gifted. Um, you know, we, on our team, we had a valedictorian from a high school. Uh, we have 4-0 students. We have students that um, are, you know, do their undergrad and that are, you know, pursuing master's degrees. We've had PT students, AT students, uh, students that are doing pre-med. Um, and then it's also, there's a place for, you know, not to be cliche, but a, a blue collar student, you know, students that maybe aren't that, but um, need a more intimate, smaller environment, maybe need a little bit more support. Um, and my student experience was, was that, you know, I went to Randolph-Macon, which 
think at the time it was around 1,100 students or 1,050, something like that. And I really enjoyed, I don't know if I needed that, but I really enjoyed, you know, sitting in a class with 12 people, 15 people, knowing every single one in the class, knowing uh, or having a, uh, a rapport, a relationship with the professor, them knowing who I was. I think one of them called me coach because I had <laughs> a uh, my book bag said Coach Beasley because it was some travel team I had coached prior to enrolling at Macon. Um, so people know you and they're invested in you. And I think that's, again, when you walk around, and this is something that we um, we certainly tell recruits on visits is, when you walk in the dining hall, they're going to know who you are. Uh-huh. They're going to know you play baseball. When you walk into your 9 a.m. business class, your professor is probably going to have a good idea of how many hits you had over the weekend or how we did. And certainly that atmosphere and environment isn't for everybody, um, but I think it, it helps us attract the right players. And then beyond that, from an athletic standpoint, you know, the big thing that we kind of really impress upon each recruit is, man, we're, we're going to be out there with you. Um, you know, we're going to help you develop One of the challenges that we kind of put down on them is like, you know, perhaps your biggest uh, challenge will be keeping up with us Mm -hmm. and matching our passion, energy, enthusiasm, not only the baseball coaching staff, but the athletic department. Um, And the guys that do that, the student athletes that do that, uh, they typically have some incredible careers here. So it's a collection of everything. Certainly, I think initially – you know, when we're picking up that call phone and making that first call, it is about baseball. You know, sometimes they've never heard about Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. Um, But as we get into it, I think a lot of times they can, okay, that that place might be for me. Okay, they have my program. All right, yeah, I'm looking for that size class. Um, But really uh, the big moment for us is getting them on campus, walking them around, um, having them meet people, whether it's current players or other coaches or, you know, Miss Claudia in the the (laughs) dining hall. and I think that's when they walk away with that that personal connection of this place and knowing that they can accomplish the things that they want to accomplish in their four years. So so getting them in the door is, you know, the biggest challenge up front. But then I imagine getting players to stay and do their full four years here can be challenging if they're not a Brandon Garcia who's starting at shortstop and batting lead off right off the bat. This is a, this is a question that's kind of stumped Emily, but – what is keeping them here after they've been here for a year? Yeah. Why, why do they want to stay here at Lynchburg? Uh, so I think the best way to answer that, so we've kind of gone through almost like two iterations of how we've recruited or, or the athletes we've recruited. So initially when we first got here, it was playing time. Mm-hmm. You know, the first two classes we had were probably our, our biggest two classes, um, but incredibly talented. And those guys got to play early. So I think that's what kept them here. Mm-hmm. Um, there wasn't necessarily a resume of success. Um, you had to go back to maybe uh, 2012, 2009. Um, you know, certainly when Coach Jones was here in the mid 2000s, incredibly talented. You can look at our banner and see how many. There, there's a proud history of baseball, but not recent when we were here. Mm-hmm. So I think initially it was, hey, we're going to help you get better, but you're going to get a chance to play, and those guys did, and they developed. And, you know, you can go look at the All-Americans we've had and what we've accomplished with those two classes, and it kind of speaks for itself. So I think the success they were experiencing and building on themselves along with the chance to play early, I think, kept a lot of those guys around. Uh, Now I think it's far less about us, the coaches, and far more of the culture and the atmosphere the players themselves have built. And certainly other teams and other student athletes are part of that. It's, mm-hmm. it's one big collective unit. You know, they all know each other. The Code Red games, they go and support each other, whether they're walking through Wake or Turner, whatever it is. They, you know, a lot of them live together. Um, you know, of course, we have baseball players that room with other baseball players, but a lot of them don't, or at least have other athletes or just other students mm-hmm. in their apartments. Um, so now I think it's a little bit more about – uh, of course, our success, you know, they, they're choosing Lynchburg baseball um, because they want to be part of a program that hopefully has a chance to at least compete for championships. Um, but I think it's more than anything the relationships they build, you know, down at the field, uh, in the classroom, in their dorms, in their apartments. Uh, and that's a credit to the players that have come through our program. That's something that has kind of evolved and taken shape over the years. Um, you know, when Coach Jones and I first got here, it was – all we talked about was culture. And then with each year, we've probably had to talk about it less and less, mm-hmm. where really the last two or three, we, we maybe haven't even mentioned it at all because uh, it kind of polices itself. Coach Jones's big phrase was culture 
culture is the boss when the boss ain't here. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you know, when we're not down the field, we're not in the office, we're not in their apartment, not in the classroom, um, you know, they kind of have to police themselves and, and they've built a, a really special thing. And, and it even kind of just like on the field, I know when we went to Iowa, the first meeting we had in the hotel with the pitching staff, I, I literally told them, I was like, my goal this week is to stay out of your way. Like you guys are ready. You have built this. You've prepared. Uh, you, I've never been around a group that's more prepared for this moment. Um, and, and I think honestly, you know, that I think applies to a lot of other things, not just on the field, but you know, trying to at least you know create some parameters and some expectations, but stay out of their way because they're capable of doing it. I think that's what keeps them around. That just triggered something in my brain about you know Iowa and the pitching staff in particular. It was completely uncharted territory for Lynchburg or even any team from our conference to be in Iowa or the location of the national championship. What does it say about those guys that not only were they doing something that was unprecedented from a team perspective, but then they all went out and three pitchers in a row did something they had never done in their careers and gone complete games, shutouts. Yeah, I mean, I think Zach might have thrown one or two before. Zach, Zach mm -hmm. always like, you know, the joke on him is like a rubber arm always felt uh -huh. great. Um, but but Wes, I think the closest he may have got is seven innings. Uh -huh. Pawn might have gone seven or eight. I think Pawn's story is a little different, where we're always a little bit uh, protective of Pawn. Uh -huh. You know, very strict on pitch counts. Uh, I I think there's probably a couple things that kind of could be connected to that. Probably the the most accurate answer probably would be just the competition we faced last year and the competition we faced the last three years um, from going down and opening up in Birmingham Southern in 2022 uh, after facing them in a regional in 21, LaGrange in a regional in 21. I think that's the thing we've gone back and looked at the, the regional we played in that COVID year where there wasn't a regional and a super regional. It was just kind of old school. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I think, six teams, I think, in that regional which was the number two team in the nation, the eventual national champion, Birmingham Southern, who had a ridiculous lineup, LaGrange, who went to the World Series the following year, us and Marymount. Um, so I think that experience, the experience of playing really good teams, hosting uh, a regional in 22, and then all of the gauntlet that we went through last year, having to play Shenandoah six different times. Um, it just like we just got better. Uh, yeah. There were some ups and downs with it, but I think uh, knowing going out there and having that experience success and experience throughout the year I think put them in a great position um you know in some ways I think that rain delay on the first night and starting that game I think at like 10 30 mm -hmm. was like a weird thing because at that point we knew we were going to play at 1 30 in the morning so it almost became less about hey we're in the world series this is our first game to oh this is silly what are we doing yeah and Zach which he's done so often in his career I mean I don't have the numbers in front of me but his postseason numbers are astronomical. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the four years or really uh, three years that he was here, 21, 22, and 23, because 2020, his freshman year, was cut short. He's pitched in a lot of ODAC postseason games, regional games, and always performed. Um, you know, and then I think for Wes and, and, and Brandon, um, you know, against East Texas Baptist, you know, facing a lineup very similar to Shenandoah, and they'd had success against them, so I think that helped. Mm -hmm. And then Potts against – once we got to Johns Hopkins, his <laughs> second start, I think he's just in that mindset of like, well, they've done it, I, now yeah. I have to do it. Yeah. So um, – and, and, of course, we had an All-American waiting behind them, so I think that helped as well. Um, so I think that was probably the easiest answer of the competition we faced. Um, but then above anything, you know, probably beyond that would be their belief in their preparation. I mean, you're talking about three guys – that are probably in the top five hardest workers on our team. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be days I'm leaving the office, walking in my car, Pond would be doing dry work on the mound. Mm -hmm. You know, Zach Potts is out there all the time helping coach, whatever. You know, Wes is a quiet guy, but, you know, Wes has probably put on like 50 pounds since his freshman year, has worked incredibly hard. Um, so probably more than anything is their work ethic and their, and their belief and their preparation, I think, put them, you know, in that position to be successful. All right, one more serious question for you. Of course, the goal every year is to win a national championship, and that can pose its own you know, trials and tribulations, and that's extremely hard to do. What does having one under your belt help or even maybe kind of hurt in, in the pressures and the, and the goals for the season? 
Uh, I'll tell you in like five months, I guess. <laughs> Uh, what a great question. Uh, truly, I don't know. Um, you know, I think last year, you know, everybody's asked, you know, did you think you'd be that good? And truly, the answer is probably like, I don't know, probably yeah. not. You know, I know when we went down opening weekend last year to Piedmont, the big question was, well, we lost Grayson Thurman, All-American, pitching with the Blue Jays now. Like, how do we replace that guy? How do we replace that guy at the back end? And we knew Jack would – would certainly be in the mix. And then you look up at the end of the year and he's put up better numbers than Grayson. Mm -hmm. And it's like, holy cow. Um, and then some injuries and other guys have stepped up. So, you know, it's probably be a similar feeling heading down to Birmingham Southern this year is, yeah. okay, you know, Pond and, Pond and Potts are gone. How do we replace them? Even though we know we have talented arms behind them. Uh, Matt Phil's coming back after, you know, having an injury last year. So we're excited about that. Um, you know, We've talked about expectations um, and what that can do for you, whether it could be good or could be bad. We're going to really try to stay away from, like, the expectations of, like, winning and losing or whatever. We have an incredibly tough schedule early that we are uh, enthusiastic about playing. You know, that's why they came here, to play good teams and to have that challenge. And I know those teams will be excited to play, you know, the reigning national champion yeah. early in the year. Uh, so we've talked about that, but I think more than anything what it's done for us, and we've we spent a good amount of time talking about this, is what we have on other teams that haven't done it is we have learned what it takes. We now know um, the work that it takes, the preparation, the drills, the time it takes to uh, requires to be put in to win a national champion, to be the quote-unquote best team in the nation. So we know that now, where other teams – you know, don't know that because, you know, they can't say that they've done that. So uh, we've had the ability to learn from that and understand, okay, this is what it takes. Um, we also have the benefit of having that confidence of knowing that, hey, if we do this, um, we can accomplish, you know, anything truly. We can go out and, and be the best team in the nation. So um, there's confidence in our preparation with that as well. Um, kind of, you know, I know Coach Jones talked about validating the work, validating the preparation, validating – you know, what we have put in place. And, and I don't know if we really needed that. I think we're always confident in it. But but our guys now have that as well. So that's really what we've tried to spend most of our time talking about is more of the, the work and the preparation that goes into it and then just having confidence in that, like we talked about with Potts Pond and, and Wes in the World Series, um, just having confidence in your preparation. And then, you know, crazy things can happen. Go out and throw a CG, your first one in your <laughs> career. You never know. All right. So and this is kind of like – my Roman empire to have you sitting down here. Cause I remember in Iowa, I had the amazing task after every game of grabbing people for interviews uh -huh. and one game, I think it was after, I think it was after game one when pots, when pots through the third straight complete game, I was like, Hey coach bees, why don't you come up here? And you said, nah, do that with the head coach. Yep. So now, now that's you. Yep. So are you ready? <laughs> are you ready for some of the media responsibilities? That comes uh, in? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've had the luxury uh, and the benefit of learning uh, under some really, really good head coaches. And it was really cool to watch Lucas uh, in that setting last year. You know, a lot of times, especially at our level, you know, there aren't big media days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you'll get a, a interview here and there. But a lot of times I'm not around for it, so I don't really hear what he's saying. Uh, it was really cool to watch him in that setting, uh, especially in Iowa. Also really cool to watch our guys in that setting. Yeah. I don't know if anybody in all those post-game talks of all those teams, I don't know if anybody was any better than Zach Potts out there. Yeah. My man was in his element. <laughs> he was comfortable. So it's cool to watch those guys, uh, you know, in that setting too. Lucas and I are very different, different personalities. We share a passion for the game. We share a passion for Lynchburg baseball. We share a passion for the University of Lynchburg. Um, so I don't know how I'll do in those settings. I'll do my best. Um, you know, I've had the, the good fortune of learning under some, some good mentors, but, um, you know, I will definitely try my best to follow his lead and, and cause I think he always did a great job of, of turning the spotlight to the players and it was never about him. Yeah. Even out there, it wasn't about yeah. him, uh, to a fault almost cause he deserves so much credit that sometimes he's reluctant to take, but I'll do my best. Well, it's head coach Travis Beasley now. Uh, you were interviewed by Hunter Pence and Perfect Game. Just going off of that real quick, were you a high socks guy like Hunter Pence when you played or you long pants? Nope. So I was in that era of like uh, when I played, especially professional baseball, Manny Ramirez with those huge pants uh -huh. covering okay. up. Uh, so no, we uh, – and I think – 
first year I had some really bad like tweener pants that maybe <laughs> came down to the bottom of your calves. Uh, college, we kind of had those, but uh, if I if I could find a pair and still that way that I can kind of stretch out and kind of have them hang over my spikes, definitely want to do that. Also had really little legs, so I didn't want to be showing those off gotcha. to anybody. Uh, then just the perfect or perfect game made me think. You ever flirt with one? No hitters. Where'd you, no, where'd you I saw I saw a couple. Uh, I think the closest I ever came, my first start, my senior year in college, through six uh, no hit innings and then got pulled because yeah. pitch count. Um, no, that's a good. No, I don't think so. I think uh, I threw some complete games, but I, I gave I threw a lot of strikes, so I gave up my hits um, for sure. All right. Well, thanks a lot for sitting down with us. It was really great hearing you, you know, talk about the national championship and then just why Lynchburg is such a great place and why national championship is always the expectation here. Yep, Tim, appreciate it. Glad to be a part of it. Go Hornets.